Aloha and welcome to Books, 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 where we discuss reading, writing, and everything in between and beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Forsythe, coming to you from Maui on the live streaming network, Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting from our studio in downtown Honolulu. The title of today's episode is So You Want to Write a Children's Book. <laughs> Joining me today is Diana Warren, author of A Frazzled Christmas Tale. Welcome, Diana. Hi, Rita. How are you today? Very good. Very good. So happy you're here. It's good. So, to yeah, uh, 40 years ago, uh, you and your husband started a business and you were going strong designing and building custom homes in the Seattle area. Uh, yeah. And you took a leap of faith, didn't you? You moved to Maui about a year and a half ago. Absolutely. We felt the call to come to Maui since we had visited several different times. It was really a necessity, I think, in our lives at the time. Yeah. And you built your own home and you just moved in, I, I understand. That's been a long process. That's for sure. I bet. Kind of getting, getting in the way of the writing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, how we met is such an interesting story. I wanted to share it with our viewers. So um, I have some neighbors who know that I just finished a book, uh, published a book called Under the Monkey Pot Tree about uh, the uh, pond here in Kihei, Isla Ie Pond. And uh, they were walking along the beach and they saw you taking a picture of your scooter. Yeah. And they said, what are you doing? And you told them, I think, that you were writing a book called The Girl on the White Scooter. Exactly. Yeah, it was kind of funny. It was a nice, beautiful evening with the sunset. You know, it's just a great time to be able to take pictures, especially since it fit with, you know, the white scooter right against the sunset. It's perfect. Well, uh, they said, oh, gee, our neighbor's a writer, too. And so they arranged us to meet kind of like match.com for writers. <laughs> Yeah. And we've been getting together ever since to talk about our craft. Yes. Yes. I've learned an awful lot from you, actually. Oh, and me from you, too. Uh, yeah, it's really surprising um, so quickly that we could meet and connect and have so much back and forth. It was, it's been great. Uh, your, your book, I believe when we first met, you had finished your book and you were deciding whether you were gonna query or not um, and decide, making decisions on the publication of it. And since then, I cannot believe that you've already started this, this uh, Paper Dolls book and you're already uh, secured an agency. I can't believe it. I mean, what's it been? A year? It's so exciting. Yes. Uh, an agent picked up my new book, Paper Dolls. Yes. And now I'm writing Paper Dolls 2. So uh, we are on our way. Oh, and happy birthday to you yesterday. I don't know if I've got a chance to say that. <laughs> Thank you. That's sweet of you. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, for sure. You. It's been like a year and you're prolific. I can't believe it. I don't even know what you do with your free time. I go on Think Tech Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. So listen, I, I want to ask you, have you always wanted to be a writer? I would say that my daughters have said that I've always been a writer. I've just written little things and, and little essays and I've tucked them away through the years. And because we've had this construction company, I'm afraid to even say since 1983, um, it's pretty much usurped all of my time between that and raising kids, right? So building custom homes and all of that through the years and then tucking away my writings uh, that I, I have to say, I have been a writer all along. Yeah. I think a lot of people can relate to that. Uh, and I, that's why I think this show is important today because so many people want to write and things like building a house gets in their way. So what inspired you to write a children's book? Well, I have to say that I've always been a little bit of a storyteller, which I'm, you probably are too, right? Uh, and so my kids and my grandkids um, have been growing up with uh, me telling them stories. And, and so frequently they'd say, Mama, will you just come tell me a story? And so we would sit and we'd tell stories over and over. And, and this one story just kept 
resonating with them and they just kept saying please please come tell the story the christmas story so that's kind of how we started with that one well why christmas you know uh, christmas has its own mystique right don't we all love the scent of cinnamon and the christmas trees and the well not in maui snow uh, <laughs> i grew up with snow right and then all the traditions that surround it and so i think that 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 Christmas story with the kids and the grandkids really um, was one that they wanted to keep hearing over and over. Yeah, wonderful. All right, now let's talk about your writing process. Um, can you tell me some of your your tricks? Uh, what is wh what do you do? Do you sit down every day? What's your writing process? Oh, well, you know, you're really sitting down every day to write is wonderful, and it's a great idea to do. Uh, I have to say with building also at the same time, especially in Maui, uh, that it's been a little bit more difficult to write every day. But I have to say with that one story, specifically with this children's story, um, it had been in my head for so long because I've repeated it and I would tuck it, little pieces of it away in my computer and then get back to work, right? Um, but I'm saying that um, writing it... <sighs> It seems to fall into place when you sit down and you can get your thoughts straight. It can just fall into place. So how did you come up with your theme? What's the theme of A Frazzled Christmas Tale? And how did you come up with that theme? Oh, well, it's funny you should ask that because it all started with my daughter when she was, well, now she's in her early 40s. When she was, I would say, six years old, she had a little mouse ornament. And it was just this cute little thing that uh, pulled in and out of a little tiny stocking. It was adorable. And um, she would every night place the, the little mouse somewhere on the tree in her own little hidden spot. And she, she thought it was a great thing. She then would walk down the hallway to her bedroom and yell over her shoulder, night mouse. Aww. And it was just the cutest little thing for Christmas. I think it was just a little cute thing for her and so she did that every every night during Christmas season and I just thought you know what if if she can feel that that little mouse hurt her then that could be a great thing oh that's so sweet yeah, yeah. now I am very impressed with the illustrations of this book it they are phenomenal how did you find an illustrator how did you get that illustrator to capture what you had in mind tell us about that process because I've never gone through that one Oh, it, it's been a blessing. Let me tell you, it kind of fell into my lap. Um, my sister read read my story and she has a friend whose daughter um, drew an illustration and won a little contest. And so she was showing the picture to my sister and my sister said, no, that is exactly, exactly what my, my sister's um, story is about. It's just very similar type kind of vintagey type of look in the watercolor and so she texted it to me right away and I couldn't believe it myself so I contacted this girl who happens to be a college student Kenzie Weiland and um, she's just a true blessing uh, she read my manuscript and she really felt that it was a good fit also so it was a match made in heaven there so uh, then we really worked through the process because um, as soon as she read the manuscript, she drew um, the picture of the main character, um, Joe, with his frazzled tail. And um, as soon as she did that and she sent it back to me, I just thought, we've got this. We've got this. So uh, as soon as she got Joe down, she really took Joe in for the feeling that he had on this on that first chapter. And from that moment, we just kind of worked out each little character as it went along and tried to make some movement with it. But I'm telling you that this illustrator, being as young as she is, especially, um, she was a gem to work with. And um, I would work with her in a heartbeat again. Wonderful. Oh, now, this, this, this next picture here are some bloopers that she did. And she gave me permission to be able to um, print them out. So I actually got on a website and, and connected all of these little pictures together so that I could make them look a little bit vintage like. And then um, we put those little blooper pages at the front and at the back of my book. Oh, uh, they're absolutely incredible. Fun. Well, without further ado, would you read to us from a frazzled Christmas tale? <clears throat> I certainly will. I'm going to start at the end, if that's okay with you. Of course. 
It's called, this chapter is The Tin Box. After Pi, the family brought out the rusty tin box noticed in the library. This was an event. The family gathered around the array of photos. I remember when, no, she was only three. There was laughter and there were more photos were passed around from the box. My papa's grandpapa was, and on it went for quite some time. Joe sat quietly on his limb, his eyes and ears set so he could catch as much of the conversation as possible. Thomas Jr. spoke, ah, this one, see this one? I was named after my papa Thomas. He leaned forward, forward to the younglings, reached over and tapped at the old photo on the table. You know, he had a heart of gold. I never knew anyone kinder. He was just a boy when his own papa died. He took care of his mama. Yes, it was a hard time for the two of them and they had little money. Even as a young boy, he worked hard and earned enough to get by, kept the family in food. It was obvious Thomas Jr. was deeply affected by his papa's hardship. Times like that shape who we are, right? He said. He wasn't expecting the family hunkered over the photos to answer, but a certain red fox in the tree nodded slowly and patted his eyes with his charred tail. As storytelling finished and Christmas Day neared its end, Thomas Jr. slowly got up from his chair. Well, I must see your beautiful tree since I heard about last year's fire, he said. I expect you already know this family has been blessed each Christmas season. I don't know how to explain. Inspiration always just happened. Yes, I imagine my papa and grandpapa had something to do with it, he winked. Thomas Jr. searched the tree for the four antique wooden creations, creations and gently lifted Joe out. Ah, I see, I see the burnt tail here. So strange that is, is the only ornament damaged. He stared intently into Joe's wooden face as if something, as if looking for something. Hmm, a mystery, or is it magic? Then the large worn hands reached out to the round mouse ornament and touched Charlie's leather satchel. You know, I have one of these bags. I brought it with me today. It's the original one from the war. Thomas Jr. turned to Anna. I have a slow walk. Can you fetch it for me, Anna? You'll find it sitting by my coat and it has a gift inside. He winked again. Anna hopped up with excitement and then slid down the hallway in her jingly slippers. She returned in a flash with the old man's worn satchel and a question. Grandpapa, may I see? Thomas Jr. nodded with a chuckle and unbuckled the satchel and pulled out the package. The family looked on as Anna unwrapped the gift. It was intricately carved bright red fire truck ornament complete with a ladder. They all gasped and then their tears showed what the trust league ornaments meant to the family. And now their hand carved fire truck. Clearly Thomas Jr. was blessed with the same wood carving skill as his grandpapa Stanley had been. This antique looking fire truck seemed as if it was crafted by the same hands as the trust league. There were grateful hugs and thank yous and the old man smiled Then he reached up with his calloused fingers and hung the fire truck on a tree bough next to the trust league. He said, in case you have another fire, perhaps the red fox Joe might use this fire truck to put it out instead of using his tail. He stared directly into Joe's wooden eyes and then gave a slow wink before turning back to the family and beginning his long hobble down the hallway. As Thomas Jr. left the room, Joe choked up with overwhelming emotion. The trust league all nodded and lovingly edged closer together, shoulder to shoulder, heads bowed. They shared a silent, tear-wiping moment. Joe, his eyes tightly closed, slowly reached out his tail behind him as far as he could stretch it just enough to touch the new bright red fire truck with his frazzled tip. It comforted him more than words can say. The trust they could hear the goodbyes and good wishes as old Thomas Jr.'s coat was lifted onto his shoulders. From the tree, they heard old Thomas Jr. say loudly, why, what a handsome scarf. Edna tilted her head, looked thoughtfully at Joe, and with a voice thick with emotion said, done. It was an incredibly good day. It was the best Christmas season ever. <laughs> oh, That's my. it. I could listen to you all day. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're so cute. How fun. Have you read that to your grandchildren? 
Uh, actually, no, because they're all good readers. Oh. So the, the youngest one, I had got a picture sent to me of him sprawled out on the couch reading it. And it didn't take him very long at all to find the acknowledgments of his name there in the acknowledgments because he was oh. one of them that pushed me to go ahead and write this book. Oh, that's yeah. just to be treasured. Yes, yeah, fun. <laughs> Well, back to our discussion on how to write a book. Um, now, when I was, as I've been working on my journey uh, as an author, mm -hmm. the, I think the most surprising for me was not creating the book, coming up with ideas, writing the thing. It was the editing, the publishing, the marketing. Yes. And that's not really my forte. I just wanted to sit down in my little office and write my book. But and oh that's no. not uncommon. That's not uncommon <laughs> at all. Yeah. There's so much more to it nowadays. So much more. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the editing. Uh, talk to me about your editing process. Did you use different products for editing? Did you just edit it yourself? Did you hire a professional editor? Yeah. Editing. Yeah. Okay. Well, the editing portion um, was, I felt very young at this. This is very new to me um, because I wanted to bring it to a book. Uh, so I started off with like grammarly.com, you know, where yeah. you can, yeah. So it's kind of a basic, okay. You've got the, the sentence structure wrong here. So I, I did that. I performed that. And um, then I decided, you know, I, it takes research for you to um, see what the options are first to, on your editing. And one of them, one of my options was to just have a line editor. And I thought, well, my, that might be a good, a good idea to start with. And really hindsight, I think I could have just not done that at all, but it was cheap enough. So I hired someone online. Um, she lived in Australia and she just did a simple line, um, edit for me. And really, I think Grammarly did a pretty good job as far as that goes. You know, there, uh, there wasn't very many changes from that. But then when I chose my publisher, because um, I self-published, um, then when we got to the point where almost formatting, um, then I had the option whether I wanted to have it uh, formally edited by, by one of their team. And um, so I chose to do that, which I think was probably the smartest way to go. So if somebody goes through the same type route I did for a self-publishing, then there's always that sort of option to, to choose. And um, the thing that you have to be careful with editing is um, the person that's editing is human also, and they have certain ways that they like to see the sentence structure. And I have a tendency, uh, because it's a bit of a vintage type of book, I have a tendency to go into um, more of a passive kind of uh, language. And um, if I had this editor take out all of my sentence structure, then it would no longer be mine, right? All it would be is an idea and somebody else's English. So um, you do have to pick and choose. Even when the editor does their thing, they send it back to you and you can say yes or no that you want the sentence to be a specific way. So keep your voice is what I would be saying oh, it, when you go to do your, your editing, that you would keep your specific this, the sound that you want, um, because, you know, there's a, a great rhythm to your sentences. And um, if you want it a specific way, then go ahead and be strong about that. Mm -hmm. But then listen to the editor too, because, you know, you don't want it to be wrong either. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and the nice thing about professional editors, especially if you find a good one, and I've been blessed with my editor, mm -hmm. is that they will do a sample for you, you know, so you can kind of shop around Yes. for editors. I don't know if you found that. To yes. be true that first you. line item one did. She did send me a sample. You're right. You're absolutely right. And that's a, that's actually a good point. Yeah. And they, uh, my editor is not cheap, but man, is she worth it? I don't think I would have gotten an agent had it not been for the professional editing. Because yeah. you know, I'm pretty good at editing, but boy, uh, the, the things that, that my editor pointed out to me, I I just thought was brilliant. And did you have to take some some um, uh, voice back on any of your editing? No, she, especially for Paper Dolls, she said uh, at the beginning, she thought, am I going to be able to keep this voice up the entire book? Keep it consistent because it's yeah. unique. Yeah. And 
then she as she read along she realized yeah this is this is working so she kept it because oh, uh, the whole book is a little strange it's a little strange it's a crazy <laughs> murder thriller thing it's nothing like the monkey poetry the monkey poetry is a lovely book <laughs> paper dolls is is a crazy murder serial killer book <laughs> I think that's what's that's what's fun about you rita i love it <laughs> Oh, let's talk about publishing. So uh, you self -pub you self published, you said. I did, and um, there are different ways of self publishing. I mean, I, I read one book. I did a lot of research. Um, I did. I know that there's one author that actually self published every. I mean, she went. She did everything. She formatted her own books. She added the illustrations the way she wanted them. She um, had the illustrations digitally done the way she needed them, and um, and then she sent it to basically a book printer. Um, so I know that you can do that. I did not. Um, oh. you could, yeah, yeah. I, I went the self publishing route where they hold your hand. And, um, I, I think that if someone were to start out doing a book that they should really look at what their options are and, and realize what they need. And so this one was a perfect match for me. Um, I went with life rich and, um, they, they asked you questions and you could answer however you wanted to, what, what format do you want? What size do you want? What, you know, what type cover, what, you know, all the basics. Uh, but then the things that I did have power through were, this is where I want my illustrations set. And then they would send it back to me and say, is this right? Is this how you want it? Where that one person that I read a book about where she did, had to do it all, where she just like taped it to her wall and with all the formatted pages. And I thought, I can't do that. No, she, she even had to do her own applications for Library of Congress and the, and the um, ISBN numbers and all of that. And my self-publishing company did all of that for me. And um, so that, that's the whole self-publishing route that I went anyway. Uh, so the next part is about marketing. And that part scared mm -hmm. me to death when I first started this process. But, you know, I'm getting into it and I really love it. I'm I want so to explain you. your, your <laughs> website uh, is part of your marketing scheme. And I can't yeah. wait for you to talk a little bit about your website uh, your blogs, all that goes into that uh, amazing tool. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah. The, it was a big deal. Okay. When I was writing my book, which only really took three weeks to do, uh -huh. um, the whole thing in the back of my mind was how am I going to actually market this? Like you're right. Right. Um, so I had been writing little blogs having to do with, um, with our Maui projects. And the whole the whole move to Maui, uh, the process that it took, which is a huge process because we own a construction company, and uh, it was a big deal to uh, buy a piece of property and all of the uh, goings on with the shipments and everything. So um, I blogged it all, and I had it all on pages, and I and I thought, well, okay, well if I do one website that collects that I have uh, all of my Maui projects, all of the, I called it our messy, but perfect move to Maui, all of my regular writings. So it'd be a different blog page. Um, and I called it um, the um, rear view, the headlights in the rear view, and then um, a video blog of all of the actual um, building of our house. So I have a, a video blog where I went onto YouTube channel and, and I made videos uh, produced those, and then I posted them on the website also. So I figured I would have that website set. Now I made one page, and I don't know if you'll see it on there where it says blog at the top. Um, if you do a down button on that, you'll see all my pages, and one page is for um, a frazzled Christmas tale. So then I could I could market my book. So now that I have the website, which I actually hired somebody to do that for me because I I was building a house. So I had them design this website um, so that then I could put into it. And, but then 
everybody should have a budget, right? Um, so if you're a writer and you're wanting to, to write a book, then you're going to want to have a budget. And my budget did not mean that I could have somebody do my website and keep loading it and, and take care of all of the SEO services, um, the social media and all of that. I wanted them to teach me how to do it. So they taught me how, after they set up the website, they taught me how to manage it, how to um, then market back and forth so that when I did a blog, then I could market it onto Instagram and Facebook and then link it back to YouTube channel. And so back and forth, the more back and forth that you do on your marketing, then the um, more ag algorithms you get um, toward uh, your name being pushed forward or your website being pushed forward on the internet. So that's what I learned. Uh, the marketing is a huge thing. So the more marketing that you can do uh, and then link back and forth between all of the social media, um, then, then uh, it draws more followers to your website. So I managed to get um, followers to my website by doing that. So I want to ask a question from our viewers. What advice would you give budding novelists? Budding novelist. I would say I'm guessing that this budding novelist has all the stories already in their head. I would say get as much down as you possibly can. And uh, while you're getting it down, then definitely take the time to, um, to research where you're going to go with it and start working on your marketing because you can't wait till you finish the book and then start your um, online presence. You got to start doing it now and see what draws people to you and, and um, be a human being, you know, just be you. And that's what will draw people. That is so true. Wise words from a wise woman. <laughs> My final question is, what are you reading? What's on your bedside table? Well, guess what? What's on my bedside table is my air conditioning remote. But I am I am reading Half Broke Horses by Jeanette Walls, which is a story about her great grandmother and her life in Arizona. So it was kind of an interesting story. It's good. What are you reading? Oh, um, I am reading The Path Between the Seas by David McCullough. Nice. about the creation of the Panama Canal because we are traveling to the Panama Canal next month. I heard you're I'm, going, I'm excited. That's great. Yeah, and I know nothing about its epic history, so I need to study up. It is a thick book. Well, that is all the time we have today. Boy, this went fast. And I know I it was a joy to talk to you. <laughs> and you. And we'll get together over coffee next week. Let's do it. That's all the time we have. Oh, my goodness. I want to thank you, Diana, for being my special guest, our thank broadcast you. engineer, our floor manager, and Jay Fidel, our executive producer. Yeah. A special mahalo to our underwriters. And thank you for joining us, viewers. Book, book, books. We'll be back in two weeks with my friend and host, Elaine Gallant. Until then, read, write, and create your world. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.